Uh, good morning again, and uh, well, I'm very pleased to, to take the opportunity to introduce one of our uh, keynote speakers uh, today. We're really excited to have Larry Merlo, who is the president and CEO of CVS Health, uh, one of the nation's premier health innovation companies. I probably didn't have to say that. You probably knew that already. But anyway, um, see, I'm going to just a few statistics on CVS Health, because as much as we understand the presence of C CVS in our lives, um, and it does have one in mind, for certainly I think all of you probably have uh, had the opportunity to use one of their products or facilities. Uh, and we'll We'll get a chance maybe to talk about some of that. But just a few statistics you'll be interested in. CVS Health touches more than 100 million people each year through its unique combination of assets, 9,900 retail locations, approximately 1,100 walk-in medical clinics, a leading pharmacy benefits manager with approximately 92 million plan members, a dedicated senior pharmacy care business serving over a million patients a year, a leading standalone Part D prescription drug plan, and of course, the recent acquisition of Aetna. Now, they, it serves more than 38 million people in various insurance products, including the rapidly growing Medicare Advantage. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, but as I said, I get, my guess is that everyone in this uh, audience has been touched by one or multiple touch points of CVS Health. I was joking earlier that, in fact, a secret um, around members, for members of Congress is not only do we go to CVS for what you the essential products of life that you need, uh, but in fact, before there was a Trader Joe's in Eastern Market and a Whole Foods mm -hmm. towards the stadium, it also was a place where we sometimes got breakfast, uh, lunch, and occasionally a late dinner uh, pickup <laughs> to survive while we were um, on the hill. So thank you for helping to uh, keep me hydrated and nu <laughs> some nutritious products uh, at some of the odd moments as a member of Congress. We didn't all dine out all the time. But anyway, it was an important part of uh, survival uh, as a member of Congress. So um, Larry is a pharmacist by training. He's a graduate uh, of the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy in my home state of Pennsylvania. He joined CVS Pharmacy in 1990 through the acquisition of People's Drugs. You may be familiar with that if you go back a ways here in Washington. And he climbed the ranks of responsibility at CVS, leading the growth in, in retail pharmacies nationwide as president of CVS Pharmacy. Under Larry's leadership, I'll mention one of the um, really important things that they've done, and there are many, but under his leadership as president and CEO, CVS helped pioneered the bold approach to total health by making quality healthcare more affordable, accessible, simple, and seamless. They showed commitment to personal and public health in 2014 with their landmark announcement to eliminate tobacco sales in all of its stores. Uh, it is the only, it was not only the first, but the only pharmacy that has done so uh, in this country, uh, at least big chain pharmacy. So I thought it would be a beginning of a movement, I think, but they stand out as um, truly a reason to have changed their name to CVS Health. Uh, that reflected this broader commitment uh, to health care and health status for people. So we're very pleased to have you with us today. I want to thank uh, Larry for the, your being here, for your sponsorship of this summit, for your support for BMA, um, and your support, of course, for Medicare Advantage. So um, it's really much appreciated, and we look forward to hearing how your work in contributing to the goals that so many of us share, uh, which is really making health care more consumer friendly. So with, with that, would please join me in welcoming Larry Merlot. Okay. So welcome. Uh, and we're going to start right in. Uh, and uh, we have a great audience here of smart, involved people in, in healthcare in a variety of ways. So I know they're anxious to hear from you. So, Let's start in with um, CVS Health and Aetna have been a combined company now for uh, eight months. Uh, and many in this audience, and I think many policymakers more broadly, are keenly interested in seeing what that means uh, and how the services, products, new way of thinking um, really is going to change for, um, for CVS Health and, and for the insurance plans and, of course, what it means to Medicare Advantage. So, you know. Uh, let's start there. I'll give you a chance to talk about just where this is all going. And um, 
I ask you to talk a little bit too about um, the consumer experience. I mentioned mm -hmm. that. You know, I think it's you come at this with a real sense of. Well, we've talked about this a lot at this conference about making healthcare more consumer friendly um, and consumer oriented. It's been so oriented towards to the provider side. And so um, how does that play into all of this as well? Well, Allison, uh, first of all, it's great to be here. Uh, you know, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me and uh, great to see many of you. And uh, it's a great question. Uh, you know, we, I, I think everybody in this room sees the challenges that you know, we face in healthcare. It's become too costly and, and it's become way too complicated to access and to use. And, you know, I saw a recent Gallup survey that 55% uh, of the respondents said they have a growing and great concern over healthcare affordability, healthcare accessibility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about our, our Medicare population. We all know we got 10,000 people aging into Medicare every day. That's going to go on for more than a decade. Right. And you think about the challenges that exist today, and we haven't seen that, that peak in terms of the demand and the needs for service. Uh, you know, it, it's, okay. it's going to be coming at us with you know, greater intensity than, than where we mm -hmm. sit today. So, you know, Allison, to your point, we have been on this, this journey in terms of you know, how do we transform the consumer health experience? And you, know, you think about you know, what does that mean? And for us, as part of, you know, CVS and Aetna becoming one company, th there are three keys to really bringing that strategy to life. One is, you know, how do we make healthcare more local? And how do we meet people where they are? Whether it's in the community, in their home, or for many, seniors including, included a, a growing portion in the palm of their hand. You know, th the second key is how do we make healthcare more simple? And, you know, the things that we can do to, it will help people more easily access the information, the resources that they need uh, to make informed decisions. You know, and the third key, and, and this is, we think about this as our North Star, that how do we help people achieve their best health? And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about this. And in doing so, reduce overall health care costs. So, you know, Allison, to your point, it's been, uh, it's been about seven months, eight months, uh, I lose track. I've lost track of time <laughs> completely. Okay, and yeah, you know, listen. We're I, I'm really pleased with how the assimilation, the integration is going as we become one company. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a series of broad-based initiatives that you know we're working on that fall under those those three keys around local, simple, and you know improving health. And Allison, your your last point, that probably the most visible you know, activity that we have going on is, you know, building these concept stores. And, you know, we're calling them the health hub. Think of them as a community health destination. Mm -hmm. And we opened up, uh, you know, a handful of these stores in the Houston, Texas market, uh, you know, shortly after the first of the year. Uh, the consumer response to them has been terrific. So, you know, what is a health hub? You know, how is it different? And so if you picture, your CVS pharmacy today, picture that store with, you know, about 20% of that space where we sell a lot of products, you know, becoming more services. So if you were walking into a health hub, you may be engaged with, you know, uh, an employee that, you know, we're referring to as a care concierge. And, you know, they'll engage you in a conversation in terms of what's different about this store and a conversation about, you know, things that are important to you as it relates to your path to better health. So certainly the role of pharmacy... What kinds of things? Yeah, what, kinds of, what kind of services are you talking about? I'm yeah, the, the role of pharmacy continues to be, you know, critically important, especially when you think about the role that medication adherence plays. But, you know, you think about the role of Minute Clinic. You know, Minute Clinic was born out of, you know, treating acute care. And we have an expanded role for Minute Clinic where... You know, we're focused on the management of chronic disease and additional services to include phlebotomy. Uh, you can schedule an appointment with uh, a licensed dietitian to focus on nutrition. Uh, we have additional health-related products that you know, may be important for someone who is convalescing after an injury or some type of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, uh, you know, so it, there, there's no single answer, but you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, back to that point of being local, you know, we're making, 
you know, healthcare more accessible to many. Recognizing today about 70% of the U.S. population lives within three miles of one of those 9,900 CVS pharmacies. So one of the other dynamics, you know, Allison, that, that, that's interesting, especially as you think about, you know, the Medicare, you know, population, you know, we have a wellness area within the store. And, you know, so we're providing education. You know, we're helping people understand how to use their benefit design in, you know, the most effective way. I actually have a picture. I should have brought it with me to throw up on the screen that, you know, in that wellness area, we have a group of seniors doing chair yoga, oh. okay, as an exercise. So, you know, it, it, again, it's another example of becoming part of the community. Interesting. It does change things a bit, that's for sure. But many clinics already did do a bit. Can you speak about how that relates to the primary care provider um, and how the, the broader health system? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, first of all, we, in, in this model, we see playing a complementary role you know, to that of the primary care physician. And, and I'll use chronic disease as the yeah. example. That, you know, you think about a patient with diabetes, you know, they're probably visiting the physician on a quarterly basis. They have a care plan. It's got medication, diet, nutrition, exercise, uh, a regular cadence for checking blood glucose levels. But I, I would say our system fails too many individuals in terms of what happens between those physician appointments. Mm -hmm. So that same person who's visiting you know, their physician on a quarterly basis is probably visiting their pharmacy you know, every other week you know, because of their ongoing needs. And again, you know, back to you know, becoming part of the community. So we can play a complementary role ensuring that that, that that patient, that member's care plan is, is being met. And you know, there are countless stories out there where you know, someone falls off the plan no one knows until the unintended medical event that requires you know, emergency treatment and perhaps hospitalization. You know, it's, we're not helping that person achieve their best health, and at the same time, we're adding costs to the system. You know, we were talking about this in, in, a, in another forum, and you know, at the end, somebody said to me, Larry, it sounds like you're gonna cure diabetes. And I said, no, we're not gonna cure diabetes, but think about all of the unintended consequences today where that person you know, that has diabetes isn't managing, whether it's their, their, their diet, their exercise, they're not having their blood glucose levels checked on a regular basis, and, you know, the unintended event that, you know, happens. Happen for, it's happening far too many times, and, and we see filling that void. Uh, this is on, not on our script, but I'm going to ask it anyway, but uh, not too dangerous. But we, it is a question, but it's really the role of the pharmacist. We've talk, talked a little bit of this um, when we were talking earlier. Uh, that's part of the role of the pharmacy. Your point that obviously we know that the issue for seniors is managing chronic conditions. Yes, those acute episodes of care are needed and happens, but some of them can be avoided if you actually are managing your, your chronic condition differently. And you're right, people are in and out of your CVS stores all the time uh, to be able to talk to someone who might know something about this and to actually really enhance that role of the pharmacy and the pharmacist in particular. And as a pharmacist, talk about that, because we talk a lot about the need for uh, well, the concerns about both cost to pharmacy, but the uh, prescription drugs, but also really finding that you took that medicine, you had some side effect you didn't like, and you didn't really want to bother the doctor, and what do you do about that? And what about that question you really have that the pharmacist always asks you and says, do you have any questions about this medication? My guess is the answers to those questions is pretty significant. So talk about how that plays into all of what yeah. you're doing as well. No, Alison, it's a great question, and, and maybe, maybe I'll start you know, with just a couple of stats that, you know, we've got a growing shortage of primary care physicians. Yeah. So that number is expected to reach more than 90,000 within the next 18 months. And, and just from my perspective, I, I don't see a physician solution on the horizon, okay? So you think about the, access, the, the access uh, or accessibility, you know, to care, you think about the role of the pharmacist as being uh, mo the most accessible healthcare professional. You know, there have been countless, uh, you know, I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it's Nielsen or Gallup that, you know, has been doing these surveys around most trusted, you know, professionals, not within healthcare, this is broadly. Uh, and pharmacists have ranked in the top three for, I think, the last 12 to 15 years. 
you know, and, and it's for the reasons that, you know, they're in the community, uh, they're accessible, you know, people get to know their pharmacist. And as, you know, Allison mentioned, I'm a pharmacist for education, or a by education, and started, you know, my career here in, in the D.C. area at, at People's Drug as a pharmacist. You know, that dynamic, and I, I, 40, more than 40 years ago, okay, I probably shouldn't have said that, okay, but, you know, the, dun the dynamic in terms of the engagement between pharmacist, you know, and patient consumer, that hasn't changed. You know, and I could remember as a pharmacist what, you know, people would tell me, you know, oftentimes I'd say, well, have you talked to your physician about that? And they would, they would say, no, should I? And, you know, there were times that absolutely you need to talk to your physician about this. And, you know, every now and then someone would say, well, would you call them for me? You know, and, you know, so we talk a lot, and, and I would say that there is a lot of, um, you know, energy behind pharmacists practic practicing, you know, to the top of their license. There's so much more that, you know, a pharmacist can do, you know, as an important member of that patient's care team. Uh, and, you know, and it's, and we, you know, Allison and I were talking earlier, we have, you know, a lot of physicians on our team, uh, and I've talked to our chief medical officer, and he said to me, and he said, Larry, as a practicing physician, I always took the phone call from the pharmacist, okay, because for the reasons that I just described, that, you know, is there something, it's not a question of something that I missed, is there something that the patient told the pharmacist that they didn't tell me? that is important in terms of complementing their overall care. So we're on the right track in terms of the things that we're doing today, and there's so much more you know, that can be done. That's great. Well, I think it's actually really exciting because I think you're absolutely right. The um, workforce is an issue, and healthcare with, with 10,000 more seniors is going to change a lot in almost every aspect of our society, but in healthcare, it's going to have a huge impact. So uh, we, everyone should be working in full scope of practice personal side, but um, opinion, but I think it's pharmacists as well. So talk a little bit more about um, how you see uh, Aetna and Medicare Advantage in particular, and either the relationship there or just independently how you see them um, contributing to that drive to value that we've spent a lot of time talking about at the summit. Well, listen, it, first of all, it's a very important component, uh, you know, of our business. And, and listen, we're, we're working hard and uh, and proud to you know provide whether it's you know new technology, new models, new partnerships, mm -hmm. uh, you know to you know better serve uh, you know our beneficiaries. And you know one one of the things that you know Allison I mentioned earlier, we got a whole variety of initiatives that we're working on. One of the things that we're thinking about is how do we simplify the patient journey, you know, and and how do we look at that across the continuum of care and. You know, the example that, uh, you know, that we're using, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, I brought a video with me. I'll ask uh, folks to queue it up in just a minute. But, you know, th think about a, uh, you know, a senior, you know, who's having knee replacement. And, you know, so, and assume that it's happening, you know, yesterday or, you know, and they're discharged today. And that's where I, I like to describe the uncoordinated post-op you know, journey environment begins because, you know, that person gets discharged. They need, a, you know, a caregiver to get them back home, but they leave the hospital with a whole list of other things, you know, probably some, you know, prescriptions for short-term pain relief, but, you know, probably a walker or a cane, a shower seat, okay? And, you know, this is where, again, the system becomes very fragmented and breaks down because it's not just getting home from the hospital. It's, you know, what happens in the subsequent days and weeks in terms of follow-up appointment with the physician, you know, as well as physical therapy if it can't be provided for in the home. So maybe we can cue up the video because, you know, with that mindset, you know, I'd like you to watch this video with the mindset of reimagining how that experience changes. So after years of managing my knee pain, my doctor determined I might need my knee replaced. I tried everything, including physical therapy and losing weight, and then I got an MRI. 
which revealed I'd probably have to have knee replacement. I was a little nervous about surgery and the whole recovery process, but then I got a call from an Aetna nurse care manager, and she walked me through the whole process. She made sure my orthopedic surgeon was in my network and close by. And before surgery, the local Aetna community care team actually came out to my house and did an assessment to make sure it was safe and easy for me to get around. They recommended that I meet with a home health specialist at my local CVS pharmacy. He made sure that I had the correct supplies, like the right walking cane and ice packs for my recovery at home. He also brought me to the pharmacist to discuss my current medications to understand how the pain medications would interact with them. After surgery, I had access to a 24-hour nurse to call with any questions, like managing my pain medications, or check to see how my knee was healing via telehealth. With the CVS Pharmacy app, I got refill reminders and could have my medications delivered right to my house. When I was ready, they set me up with a physical therapist and tips on getting around. My Apple Watch reminded me when I needed to keep moving, take my meds, and see my physical therapist. My Aetna nurse care manager even helped me manage the overall costs of surgery and made sure I understood the bills. It was comforting knowing I had a partner through it all and that I could just focus on getting back to doing what I love. So, yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> so we, we uh, were on target and we hope to have this in a pilot in market later this summer. Well, that's pretty exciting because we've been talking here about the, how fragmented healthcare is, how confusing it is, how people fall through the cr cracks. So this is really exciting to have another tool. Well, so, so I'm sure that you know, there are, are many in this room that, you know, whether it's friends, neighbors, relatives that know you, you, know, you do something in healthcare. And you know, just think about the number of times that someone entering the healthcare system for the first time we end up getting that phone call in terms right. of what do I do? You know, where do I go? How do I get started? Yeah. That's the challenge that, you know, we, it's the, you know, we, uh, we call it a challenge, but it's really an opportunity that's in front of us. Okay. Uh, a couple other questions, and then we do, we'll take questions from the audience. If you want to write questions on those postcards or little note cards, um, you can do that and just, I don't know, or James or Jeremiah, Jeremiah will somebody pick it up and, and, uh, and uh, hand them off to me. And I think Christine's helping a little bit too, so it's great. But uh, two other questions I wanted to ask. One is um, Medicare Advantage, we've done some research on this, and I think you, uh, you know this as well, is a higher number, percentage of minority populations choosing Medicare Advantage. And in Medicare Advantage, the number for Hispanic seniors is quite astounding. It's well over 50% of Hispanic seniors are choosing Medicare Advantage. And for African-American seniors, they're also at a higher percentage than they are in, in traditional uh, Medicare. So how CVS, had, uh, particularly addressing what we know and understand is, is health disparities across the healthcare system, in some ways it feels that Medicare Advantage should be particularly attentive um, because of these high numbers. Obviously, they're doing something right because they're choosing Medicare Advantage, but could you speak to that? Because again, you, are, you have that, up, that footprint in local communities, so um, how does that actually um, yeah, uh, relate to some of your mission and goals? Allison, may, maybe I'll start by sharing a story because it, it, it's a story that has an important learning behind it, and this was, I'm, I'm going back probably maybe eight, 10 years I was with our retail team. We were down in the Miami, Florida market, and you know we were in the Hialeah area. And and for those that know, you know that geography pretty well, large Hispanic uh, neighborhood. We were in one of our stores that looked great. People were, you know, they were upbeat, you know, friendly. We were having good discussion with the staff. There was only one issue: there were no customers. And you know, so we go down the street. And you know, there was a local operator, uh, and we found where all the customers were. The store was extremely busy, and it had a very different look and feel. So you know, we had the same store in Hialeah that we had in you know, Georgetown, okay? And, you know, and, and that, was, that was the learning. So if you went back to that same Hialeah store today, you know, the... Uh, the sign outside the store would say CVS y Moss, you know, representing that you know, in Spanish, CVS and more. 
And when you walked in that store, it would feel very different you know, than the store down the street. Uh, you would have about anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 you know, products that are very important you know, for that Hispanic consumer in the home. Uh, you'd see bilingual signage and a bilingual staff, and you'd see different services you know, in that store. So this whole dynamic of, uh, I'll, I'll refer to it as personalization, and you know, really understanding you know, the, the consumer uh, that was a very, very important learning for us. And, and, you know, those are things that we're working on. We know that, you know, uh, you know Medicare beneficiary value the, you know, additional benefits or offerings. And it, it's, it's really, you know, matching up, you know, that personalization with the needs of, you know, yeah. uh, of the individual. We just talked talked about the uh, importance of building trust mm -hmm. uh, in the relationships I mean, that's across the healthcare spectrum, and that's part of it, is these to feel and look like a place you'd be comfortable in as a start, as a good start. Well, that leads also to the conversation about social determinants of health. Um, again, it's become sort of a code word around here, but we're hoping it's more than that. Uh, and there's new flexibilities in Medicare Advantage to be able to provide some additional supplemental uh, benefits, and they do, and to target it, of course, to, uh, to deal with chronic illnesses. So how does that whole discussion, again, about social determinants actually get operationalized uh, in your MA plans or in your other um, yeah. services? And uh, look, we know that you can pick up you know, some of the various studies that are out there that 60% you know, of you know, one's um, life expectancy is, is driven outside the physician's office. And, you know, we know that, you know, where you live, where you work, where you age, you know, those, those factors associated with that are important, you know, to one's health. And, you know, uh, and that, that's a challenge that we take very seriously. And, and mm -hmm. you know, earlier this year, we kicked off a, uh, you know, a campaign called uh, Building Healthier Communities. It's a, uh, you know, five-year, $100 million commitment in terms of, you know, what we can do to address you know, those, those social determinants, whether it's, you know, providing more free health screenings uh, in communities or working with uh, both national and, and local uh, nonprofit partners in terms of tackling some of the uh, health challenges that exist, whether it's, you, you brought up tobacco use earlier or, you know, the, the challenge that's before us around uh, the, the problems with opioid abuse in the, mm -hmm. in, in the country. So, uh, you know, those are things that, you know, that we're very actively, you know, working on. And, you know, to include, you know, that portion of our, uh, of our member population that, you know, are most vulnerable from, you know, from a medical point of view. And, you know, oftentimes when, when you know, when you dig deeper into that dynamic, you know, some of those societal issues, you know, uh, or the lack thereof, you know, being able to access transportation or, you know, I know in some of the breakout groups, you know, you've had discussion around that, which, you know, I know we've worked with, you know, uh, you, you know with some of you in, uh, in this room from a partnership point of view in terms of, you know, making, uh, you know, those services more readily available to, uh, to our Medicare beneficiaries. Exactly. It's exciting. It's an exciting moment. Well, you brought up tobacco products. And I do have to ask, it was such an important and really... Um, a standout decision to take tobacco products off your, off your shelves. And so could you give us a little insight into um, part of that decision making, let that decision making, um, how you actually took that, that rather bold step and what more you're, you're doing about smoking sensation and, uh, and, and dealing with what is, continues to be, unfortunately, a pretty serious problem in yeah. this country. Well, Allison, mm -hmm. it, 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 we made that decision in 2014 uh, and, you know, the... Uh, probably the months leading up to that decision, as we were moving to become more of a healthcare company, uh, you know, we would have great discussion with potential partners. And, you know, would be two thirds of the way through that discussion and someone would bring up, you know, you guys sell tobacco products, don't you? And, and when you talk about trust and credibility, it literally sucked all the energy out of the room. And we really saw this as, as a barrier to uh, our strategy of being you know, what we want it to be, uh, you know, in the marketplace. And at the same time, uh, we were selling about $2 billion worth of tobacco products. Uh, so, you know, that... Uh, it was not a decision to be made lightly. 
So, uh, you know, as a management team, we had a lot of discussion. Uh, we had, we got, we actually had tremendous support from, you know, our board of directors. Uh, and, you know, we said, listen, th this is, uh, this is the right thing to do for the long-term growth of the company. Uh, you know, we made the decision and, uh, you know, we haven't looked backwards. And, and what's interesting, you know, is there was a direct correlation to the impact that that made in our market share. That as we looked at the next 12 months uh, and looked at the rate of tobacco sales uh, across the country, there were 95 million fewer packs of cigarettes sold. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, one of the questions that oftentimes, you know, comes up is, yeah, but what about, you know, I go in your stores and, you know, you sell candy bars and, you know, uh, and potato <laughs> chips, okay, and, you know. Uh, How far are you going to go here? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and by the way, that is an important good question. point. Because a good question. as we talk to health professionals about the decision, you know, largely physicians and, you know, integrated delivery systems, what they told us was, look, there is no amount of tobacco use that can be considered safe. The same is not said, can be said about those other products. When we went out and talked to consumers, they told us something very similar with one addition, help educate me. And what you've seen us do is, you know, offer healthy snack alternatives that have, you know, reduced sodium content, you know, reduced trans fat, reduced, you know, sugar content. So, you know, we have been working hard uh, in that regard. You know, and uh, Allison, to, to your other point, you know, our work isn't done. And mm -hmm. about three years ago, we, uh, you know, we, we started an initiative called Be the First. And our goal was to, is to create uh, the, smo the first tobacco-free generation. Uh, we've worked with some nonprofit partners uh, across the country. One of our focuses was on college and university campuses to make them smoke-free. Mm -hmm. Happy to say that over 200 uh, colleges and universities have accepted that challenge and, and are uh, tobacco-free today. And, you know, one of the other things that we've done is going into junior and, and, and senior high schools to educate kids on, you know, the dangers of, of nicotine use. And, and that's becoming even more critical with, you know, the rapid rise of vaping. And I just saw a stat, you know, uh, about a month ago that, you know, uh, you know school-age kids that are vaping are four times more likely to begin smoking cigarettes before they graduate from high school. And that's something that we should all be concerned mm -hmm. with. And, yeah. You know, and I'll just wrap that up that we continue in, you know, to offer uh, nicotine replacement therapies, you know, in our pharmacies, smoking cessation, you know, programs through our Mena clinics. And when I, when I tell this story, I'm reminded of, you know, one of our pharmacists on Long Island. This, this story goes back now four years. And I remember her telling me, you know, Larry, when, when we made the announcement, you know, and these were, this was an elderly couple, so you know, um, Medicare beneficiaries. They came into the store and they told her, you know, when you quit, I quit. And she said, what do you mean? And she said, they told me that they both bought their tobacco products at CVS and the fact that, you know, we're not selling them anymore, that you quit selling them, we're gonna quit smoking them. And they went in every week for the next year, you know, and checked in with her Okay, just to let her know that they continue to be tobacco free. So, you know, it, it, it reminds me of everything that we've been yeah. talking about. It's, it's the relationship, the trust with the pharmacist, and the fact that, you know, we become part of the community. That's, that's great. Well, I had to get pregnant with my first child before my mother in law stopped smoking. She stopped smoking when I said, You can't be around me, I'm pregnant. Um, you can't be around my child. And she said, Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so any advice, it's another way to do it. But, um, <laughs> but I think it is actually modeling that behavior and being clear about it. It's, it's not an easy, easy thing to do, but yep. stopping you know, people from starting is certainly a good way to do it. Um, well, a step in the right direction. Do we have some any questions from the audience? We do. OK, great. Terrific. Okay. These are surprises to me too then, so we'll see. Um, what is the greatest service you can provide to the Medicare population? And don't call them elderly because I'm over 65. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I, 
Allison, I, th I think it goes back to, you know, what, what we've been talking about, that, you know, how do we become, you know, in, you know, uh, an extension, you know, for them, whether it's, and I think it could be different things for different people. Uh, you know, some of it may be understanding how to use, you know, the benefits that are afforded to you in the most effective way based on your health needs mm -hmm. to, you know, just being able to, you know, be a, a partner to them in terms of ensuring that whether it's staying adherent to their care plan or, you know, being that, you know, it's, I, I hate to use the word concierge, but, mm -hmm. you know, being that person that can be their quarterback, that, I, I think that's one of the challenges that, you know, that seniors have today in, you know, in a meaningful way. Right. Again, it's hard to uh, figure out how to engage the healthcare system, and it is confusing, and you, you know, you don't want to sound dumb, so you don't want to ask that dumb question, and it's really great to be able to ask a question that is, in fact, not dumb at all, but is one that really helps you really navigate your healthcare uh, system. It's a, it's a big issue. Um, how has your vision for the Minic Clinic changed since you joined forces with Aetna? Uh, and what does um, what role does the Minute Clinic play for seniors? Good question. Yeah, it's a good question. And you know, and again, you know, we see Minute Clinic being a complement uh, to primary care. Uh, you know, how it's changed is expanding you know our scope of, of of services to be able to really focus on the ongoing management you know of chronic disease. And mm -hmm. you know, and it's it's really interesting that. You know the things that, you know that we're seeing in the health hubs today. We had, you know, some of this gets back to the power of storytelling, and you know, and it's, you know, some of what I'll share is it's anecdotal, but you have to ask yourself the question: How many more, you know, members, beneficiaries do we have out there that are like the examples that I'm sharing? Mm -hmm. You know, we had uh, we had a woman who came into one of the one of the health hubs. Uh, she was diagnosed with diabetes more than two years ago, uh, and you know she has not been a regular visitor to her physician. So this isn't staying adherent to a care plan. This is following the care plan to begin with. She hadn't had her blood sugar levels tested in more than a year, so nurse practitioner did you know an, an A1C check, and it was over 12. Now, you know, for the clinicians in the room, you know, that is, you know, danger. And, you know, so we got her back to the physician, you know, immediately and, you know, and avoided one of those unintended consequences. She, there was no record anywhere of, you know, any exam for, you know, diabetic retinopathy, you know, and, you know, so you start thinking of, you know, again, how many times does that story get told? that you know, our, our system is failing many of these yeah. individuals on a regular basis. Yeah, a uh, lot, so. Um, okay, what is the biggest challenge you're facing in trying to change the consumer experience? Assuming I mean improve the <laughs> consumer experience. You've talked about that a good bit, but it really is, it's yeah. not so simple. It, it's, it, it, it's not simple. Uh, I will say that I think we've had a lot of learnings in terms of you know, what we have been doing as we've been moving to become more of a healthcare company over, over the last several years. You know, we've now seen about 45 million patient visits, you know, at Minute Clinic, you know, over the last, I'm going to say, you know, six, seven, eight years. What's interesting about 50% of those visits, I'm, I'm going outside now the, the, you know, the Medicare population, about 50% of those visits, people do not have a primary care physician. 50% of the visits are nights and weekends. So you start thinking about where do those visits end up? They end up in the ER, you know, at 10 to 15 times the cost. You know, so, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, this whole, what we're seeing in the health hubs is that, you know, consumers, you know, they are accepting a retail health, you know, community health destination. and. You know, uh, I, I even sense myself this morning using the words consumer of healthcare and patient interchangeably. I get challenged with that. I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've done that a couple times. And, you know, and 
my answer to that is, look, there are times in this environment where you know you think about a me you know we're in the doctor's office or you know heaven forbid the hospital yes we're a patient at that point in the hands of a an extremely skilled and trusted professional but think of all the activities and events that lead up to that and that follow that we're more consumers of healthcare than we are patients at that point mm -hmm. so as i think about what we're working to create you know we're we're working on the front end when we're consumers of healthcare we're working on the back end where we're consumers of healthcare and we're working, we're working hard as a member of the care team when we're in that middle phase, okay, of working with you know, the physicians and other members of the care team. Okay, well consumer is a much more active term in our minds than patient. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see if we can, well, we have to be both. Um, uh, I think time is almost up. I think I see the congresswoman in the back, which is I like to be respectful of, uh, of our next guest. Um, but any final words on where you, where you think the next big opportunities are? Um, obviously, you're embracing a lot of them, leading the way on a lot of them. But um, these are some policymakers in the room. Any, any you know, final, final words on what you hope they look out for and, and do? And some of these are also, of course, actors who are really engaged in making this happen and implementing some of these changes. But any big thoughts about where we ought to be going on, on some of this healthcare discussion? Allison, it's, listen, the, the opportunities are in front of us. And, you know, and, you know, we can, we can tick off the, you know, the various, you know, uh, you know, opportunities, whether it's the cost associated with Cytocare or many of the things that, you know, that we talked about. I think the challenge that we have in front of us is how we break down those silos. And, you know, and, and, that, and you know, Allison, back to your question is, you know, I, I think that will be our biggest challenge as we bring this new model, you know, to market yeah. that, um, you know, we'll, we'll challenge the status quo. Yeah. A little disruptive is okay, yep. um, but uh, you know I think I think that's a really good point to end on. It is really about all these really good and innovative and interesting kinds of um, models that are out there. Some very big and real ability to scale them up, um, but how does it all relate to each other? How does it in, the system become more integrated, um, more simpler, as you said, more seamless? Um, for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So with that, thank you so much thank for, you. for joining Thanks us everybody. and for the work you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>